Welcome to the Atmosphere Church channel. On behalf of all of us here at Atmosphere, thank you for watching. We pray that this message will touch your heart and change your life. Regardless of what you believe, where you come from, or what questions you might have, you are welcome here. Our desire is to help lead you in experiencing God by following Jesus. If you want to find out more information about us, head over to our website at atmosphere.church. And don't forget to click below to subscribe. Enjoy the message. Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity. Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line. Between old and new, between death and life, there stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. Come on, church. Give him a shout of praise. Death has been defeated. Victory has been secured because the tomb has been emptied. Woo! Wow, 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 wow. So, for those of you that snuck in uh, after my announcement earlier, we welcome you. Thank you for braving the traffic on T.O. Boulevard uh, just to come to church in the morning. And for you dads out there that are planning your getaway already, stop that, all right? Because we want you to hang out at our after party outside. Uh, we have uh, Pete's Coffee, and, and we have, I think, a world record of donut holes in one place. So, you know, in the Bible, they broke bread, but at Atmosphere Church, we break donut holes, all right? That's, that's what we like to do at Atmosphere. Uh, but we are so grateful that you are spending Easter morning with us. This is a first for us. We've never been at the Civic Arts Plaza. So if it was a, a little weird and wonky getting in here, just know that it was our first time doing this. Uh, maybe we'll come in again. In hindsight, we probably should have done two gatherings. Okay, I will say that. Um, but we are just so grateful. Tara and I, my wife and I, she's sitting over here. Uh, we had a dream in our heart to come to this area. We felt called to come to Thousand Oaks. At the time, I didn't even know where Thousand Oaks was. But here we are five years later after beginning this, this call, this place. It's, I'm, I'm sitting over there just weeping about what God has done in such a short amount of time. And in the middle of launching this church, we have this thing called COVID. Have you heard of it? 
and we were meeting outside in the amphitheater, and it's just, you know, it, it, it's been a roller coaster ride, but here we are in this beautiful Civic Arts Plaza, and, and we're so grateful. Uh, you know, earlier I, I mentioned this idea, like, you know, have you heard the news that Jesus is alive? And I, I don't know if you've ever had, a, like, an unbelievable experience personally, now, I was thinking about like the first disciples when they're getting word that Jesus had risen from the dead and, and the word traveled fast, right? And the gospel of John says that Peter and John like ran, they booked it to see if this news is true. And, and I don't know if we could just like personalize things. Like, have you ever had a moment in your life that you're just living in this moment and you're just like, nobody is gonna believe me or believe us that we had this experience and you're like living it out and, and afterwards you're, you're just thinking like, you know, how, how are we even going to explain what happened to us? So Tara and I and our kids, uh, uh, several years ago, we, we liked to vacation in this place called San Diego. And we, we were in San Diego and we loved going to this place called the Corvette Diner. And it's just like an old 50s thing. And we're, we're there. And we had been there a lot of times before. But we come in and there's like these, these uh, you know, uh, graphics and, and warnings. Like, hey, you're, you're on camera. And I was like, well, this is kind of weird. Weird security system. Well, we go in there and we find out they're filming a show called Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. <laughs> have, have you guys heard of this show? I believe you pronounce his name Guy Fietti. And so lo and behold, we're in there. We're like in the corner. We're like, wow, this is weird. They're, they're filming a TV show. Well, the producer comes over to Tara and I. We have our three little kids. And they said, hey, uh, we would like you to go into the middle of the restaurant. And we'd like to feature your family uh, on this show that we're doing. And I hadn't heard of the show before. So I was like, okay. So we're there in the middle of the restaurant with Guy Fieri telling them of our experience. I don't know if you have that. that picture but but you know it was a few years ago because look at Josiah that's that's little Joe right there he's now 23 years old but but you know we let we left the restaurant and we were like that was the weirdest most bizarre thing that's ever happened to our family. And, and so we're like processing this, like we're, we're trying to tell people, our friends, you know, uh, back home, we were like, yeah, this thing happened. They're like, what happened? And it's just kind of this, this unbelievable experience that we had. And, and, and I, and I kind of think it doesn't, you know, even compare to the resurrection of Jesus. But, but probably, more than likely, they kind of had these feels inside of them like, man, I can't believe we're experiencing this resurrection. Well, we are doing a talk this morning called The Resurrected Life. The Resurrected Life. And as Dylan was saying, we have an app and you can follow along on our notes. But we want to talk about this incredible event. The greatest event, listen church, the greatest event in world history. That's what we're here to celebrate today. That's why it's a party. That's why it's a celebration. And, and as we think about this, for those of you that are brand new to our church, by the way, we're not meeting here next week, okay? Uh, we're going to be back at our Townsgate uh, building. But, you know, we've been in this series over the last two months from this ancient letter that was written by this guy named the Apostle Paul and he wrote it to this church that he started. He planted this church in Corinth, this ancient city that is in Greece. And, and so he writes this letter and he's talking to these followers of Jesus, these early followers of Jesus and it's messy and he, he's walking them through some situations. Have you ever got like a long text message from a friend and it's just like it's so long that it's only a little bit and there's a little arrow next to it. You're like, oh boy, this is a read. And by the way, don't send me those, all right? Those are terrible. Um, and, and so I'm, as I'm reading this letter, this is, this is so crazy. We've been in this letter for two months looking at it chapter by chapter and Today's chapter is chapter 15. And this whole chapter is about, guess what? The resurrection. 
Now, I love it. When we planned this talk series so many months ago, I didn't know if this would land perfectly on Easter Sunday, but I'm so grateful it did because, see, it came up in the conversation that Paul was having with his followers, this, this idea of the resurrection. And there were, there were people in the church that were just having a hard time believing that there was such thing as a resurrection. And so he's like walking them through this idea of the resurrection in chapter 15. And I'm going to pray and we're going to just jump into the word of God. And we're going to read this chapter and we're going to see what Paul has to say about this greatest event in world history. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just giving us this opportunity in this building to come together as people that are in search for more of you, God, in our lives. Lord, I pray that no matter what state we might be in, that you would meet us in our mess. That God, my prayer and the prayer of every person in this church on, on the leadership team has been that today, God, would be a day that lives are changed, that people are healed, that families are restored. And Father, we pray that each and every person would have a, a divine encounter with your Holy Spirit. And we thank you in advance for how you're going to do that. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Okay, so let's look at verse 1, chapter 15. It says, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have been, uh, which, which has taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12, that he's talking about Peter. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So Paul is going to go into this whole conversation about the resurrection. He's going to say the resurrection is the backbone of our faith. See, without the resurrection, we not only don't have Easter, we don't have any relationship with God. I mean, it, it's all cut off. We, we, we have no Christianity it is the epicenter. It is the centerpiece of our faith. And so Paul is, is really trying to get them to, to hone in on this because there's a part of them that are just having a hard time, like, like leaning into this idea of the resurrection. And I believe as he goes into these metaphors and these symbols and, and these uh, kind of these parables of trying to compare what the resurrection is going to be like, I believe he was giving them a, a first person kind of narrative of his own experience with the resurrection. I don't know if you've heard of these things called near death experiences. Have you heard of these? It's a, it's a fairly recent within like history, a, a recent scientific research studied uh, thing that, that people experience, these near-death experiences. And I believe part of the reason why this is kind of a, a newer scientific study is because, hey, let's face it, 50 years ago, if you had cardiac arrest, you're Dunsville. <laughs> you're, you're gone. If you have an aneurysm, you know, you're, you're, you're out of here. Now we have medical devices and technology that when somebody has a cardiac arrest, they, they come back to life, right? They, we, they have aneurysms, we rush them into surgery, and they come back to life. And so for the last 50 years, more and more people, matter of fact, a Gallup poll recently did research on this, and they found that 1 in 25 Americans have had a near-death experience. I was reading this book this last year called Imagine Heaven, written by author and pastor John Burke. And he was, he was talking about 120 different near-death experiences that he himself has studied. And, and what impressed me the most about his book and when he was like looking at this was the, the whole idea of cardiologists and neurologists that were unbelievers, that, that were not people of God, that were not followers of Jesus, that were like looking and studying uh, their patients that, that reported back to them these encounters that they had 
while they were flatlining. And what impressed me was that a lot of these cardiologists and neurologists, after they had patients come back to life and tell them details about their whole experience, these skeptics or unbelievers became believers. Doctors, scientists, right? Cardiologists, world-renowned cardiologists, because patients would not just come back and say, yeah, I saw, I saw God, or I saw, they, they said, I hovered over my body. This is what your nurse said. This is what the other doctor said. This is what the instruments were. And, and they had no idea. They, they, were, they were dead, but they were reporting with just, great detail the things that were in the operating room. So to me, when Paul is like trying to build his case to tell the church about the resurrection, he's using his own personal experience because I believe the apostle Paul had his own near-death experience. Check this out. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, so he writes another letter to the church in Corinth. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether he was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things. Things that no one is permitted to tell. So he's he's kind of talking like in this third person. Like, I have this friend, you know. He had this experience. and, And most Bible scholars believe it was his own experience. In Acts chapter 14, this was 14 years ago, Acts chapter 14, he says, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over and they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was, what? He was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city and the next day he and Barnabas left for Derbe. Now what is so funny about this is that after he rose back up he went back into the same city that just tried to kill him (laughs) I think that's crazy but he was that crazy for God and what happened most Bible scholars believe that he was carried out dead the disciples gathered around him and prayed for life to come back into him and he came back to life and then he's writing this letter saying "I, I don't I can't even explain what happened to me when I died and I was caught up and I saw this paradise and and it's just crazy. It was crazy what I saw. So as he's trying to tell the church about the resurrection and he's like, I know it's just like, it's hard for you guys to imagine, but man, I was there. I experienced something that is real. You know, as a pastor for now over 30 years, I have known five people personally that have had clearly a near-death experience where they had an experience that was real and that they came back with vivid detail and I got to sit down with all five of these people and they told me all of these different experiences that they had. Uh, Every one of them, by the way, not just the ones that I know, but the ones that John Burke interviewed, all were greeted by a welcome party. And it's just crazy, like as we pass on to the next life, that, that relatives are there to meet us and to welcome us. And I think it's, you know, to make our transition a a lot better. Uh, But they all also had a life review. You know, one of the things that I saw popular on Instagram this year was like year in review reels, where everyone just kind of put up all their pictures and, and the reel played. Well, apparently in the afterlife, one of the first things that we get to do is we get to sit down and we get to watch a life in review Instagram reel of our own lives in heaven. And some of you are like, oh no, I'm in trouble, all right? Well, there's good news for you, so you keep listening, okay? Especially you guys at the very top. I gotta give it to you guys. You're, you, you feel far away from me, but are you okay up there? We, lo- we love you guys. You guys are experiencing your own heaven up there, all right? I feel like I'm preaching to heaven, all right? Uh, but, but as I'm... I'm thinking about these experiences. Uh, I talked about near-death experiences, I don't know, maybe a year ago. And the sweet lady that attends our cho- uh, church, Joyce uh, Ulmer, she came up to me in the hallway at our church and she said, Pastor, I had a near-death experience when I was a, a little girl. And, and in the hallway, she proceeded to tell me her story. And she told me in graphic detail, 
Now, mind you, she's a little bit seasoned now in her life. This incident happened 60 years ago. But she was telling me the story like it happened yesterday. And I said, Joyce, would you do me a favor and would you get this on camera? Because I would really love to let the rest of the church see the experience that you had. And she said, it would be my honor. So you guys go ahead and check this video out of Joyce telling us about her NDE. In 1953, my dad needed to go to Slotel Veterans Hospital and get some surgery. By this time, I was probably 13 years old. So come the day to go, we got down the street maybe two, two and a half blocks, and there was a big construction zone there. And I remember saying to my mom, look out, mom, there's a truck coming. And it was a construction truck all loaded down with lumber and construction tools. And they were driving really fast and they hit my side of the car. And everything went black. And the next thing I knew, I was, I was up there somewhere. And I looked around and there was the floor was a gray wood, like, the, like when lumber gets old, it turns gray. And the, the floor was wood. And there was wonderful smelling flowers. Oh. And the beautiful flowers and flower pots hanging from the ceiling and on the floor. And, and they had light music playing. And all these people were walking around in these long gowns. And, they never touched the floor, but they were walking around. <laughs> and all these people kept walking up to me and saying, you gotta go back. And I kept saying, no, I don't wanna go back. I like it here. And they kept saying, no, you've got to go back. It's not your time. When I finally woke up, I ended up back in the hospital. And uh, they had pronounced me dead. My major problems were I had my collarbone broken in two places. My pelvic bone was broken in three places. Uh, my right kidney was torn loose and hanging by a thread. And God took care of all of that. I'm getting tears. <laughs> and uh, so I was, uh, I, was, I was a very lucky girl. It's a beautiful feeling inside your heart inside your body to know there is life after death. It's a difficult story to believe. I know that. That sounds like some movie. It isn't, it's real. I'm getting tears again. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> if somebody asks me if I really believe that I was in heaven and that there is a God and that there is our angels and that kind of thing, I have to tell them yes. If they disagree with me, I tell them I'm sorry. I know what I know because I've been there and I've been done that. And I've been introduced to the angels and been introduced to God and, and, and if you choose not to believe that, that's your right but it's also your loss. So good. Joyce, I don't know if you're here, but maybe you could stand up and let us see where you're at. I can't see you, but there, there she is right there, right in the middle. We love you. What an amazing story. What an amazing story. So, so Paul is coming in with an experience like Joyce had. And he's like, I know the resurrection is real. Jesus visited me and then I visited heaven. And so he's trying to get these skeptics. He's, he's trying to get these uh, non-believers to come in and say, man, without the resurrection, we have nothing. He even says, we are men to be most pitied because everything that we're doing is in vain if there's no resurrection. Let me get academic with you for a minute because I love science. 
I, I was an animal science major at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. So I love science. I'm a science-minded, analytic kind of guy. And so I get if you're a skeptic today going, oh, come on, you know, isn't this thing about Jesus being resurrected, you know, isn't it just like a legend or whatever? And, you know, if you use the same kind of guidelines to prove whether or not a historical event is historical, then certain qualifications kind of make it to where it is true or it's maybe legend or it's completely false. So years ago, I read this book, and many of you probably in this room have read it, called The Case for Christ, written by a former Chicago Tribune uh, legal writer named Lee Strobel. And Lee Strobel was a skeptic. He was an atheist. He claimed that he did not believe in any sort of God until his wife had her own encounter with Jesus. And he said, I started beginning to think there may be some truth to this because the wife that I was married to started to change before my eyes. And she started being more loving, more forgiving, more tender, more full of peace. And I was like, I, I need to investigate this. So he went on his own journey to investigate this as an atheist, as a skeptic. And after he did his academics and he did his investigating, guess what? He became a follower of Jesus. That's what happens to a lot of these guys that, that start on on this quest. And he looked at the, the historicity of the resurrection and I found a video. He can explain it so much better than I could. So I'm just going to play this quick video so you can hear from Lee Strobel himself. Check this out. I like to look at the evidence for the resurrection in four categories. The first one is, did Jesus die on the cross? Was he dead? Virtually every scholar on planet Earth can see that Jesus was dead after crucifixion. We have no record of anyone anywhere ever surviving a full Roman crucifixion. Uh, even the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, published a peer-reviewed scientific medical study of the evidence for the death of Jesus and said clearly the weight of the evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Even the atheist New Testament scholar Gerd Ludeman says historically it's indisputable that Jesus was dead, so Jesus was dead. The second category of evidence is the early accounts we have for the resurrection. In other words, I used to think as an atheist that the resurrection was a legend, and that took a long time to develop in the ancient world. But what I learned is that we have preserved for us a creed of the earliest Christian church, a creed that is a eyewitness-based report of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this creed has been dated back by scholars to within months of the death of Jesus. Within months. That is historical gold. So we've got a news flash from ancient history on the resurrection. Third category of evidence is the empty tomb. And the best evidence for that is even the opponents of Jesus implicitly admitted the tomb was empty. Because when the disciples began proclaiming that Jesus had risen, what the opponents said was, oh, well, um, the disciples stole the body. Now they're conceding the tomb's empty, they're just trying to explain how it got empty. So everybody's conceding the tomb was empty. How did it get empty is really the issue, and that goes to the fourth category of evidence, which is eyewitnesses. You know, for most of what we know about ancient history, it comes from one or maybe two sources of information. And yet, for the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus, we have no fewer than nine ancient sources, inside and outside the New Testament, confirming and corroborating the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the risen Christ. That is an avalanche of historical data. So you put all that together and you have a really good case for Easter. So good. I told you he could say it a lot better than I could. So Paul is making his case saying, you guys, the resurrection is real and you need to understand it in order for you to fully experience everything that God wants to do in your lives right now. Which leads me to give you the, the two biggest things that, that, you know, what the resurrection brings us and gives us that is noteworthy for all of us to take away this morning with. And number one, the resurrection gives us victory over sin and death. Write that down. The resurrection gives us victory over sin and death. 
Like when, when Jesus conquered the grave, the power of sin and death was broken in this world. So that means that you now can live in freedom instead of captivity. That's what that means. And, and the first one I will say as Americans, we got that one down pretty well. Like for the last 200 years, like you talk to a lot of people that know about Jesus, know that point pretty well. They're like, yeah, Jesus died for my sins. But the second reason is where I think a lot of us struggle and maybe we fall short in understanding the significance. And I say it this way, the resurrection gives us an invitation to living a resurrected life. It's an invitation to live a different kind of way. I, I like to say it this way, Jesus died to get you into heaven, but he resurrected to get heaven into you. Do you know that if you're full of Jesus, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead now lives in you? Romans 8, 11, check this out. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also, what church? Give life, look at your neighbor and say it again, give life to your mortal bodies because his spirit who lives in you. Now my prayer for you, as, as we've been ramping up, getting ready for this moment, knowing that maybe a, a family or a friend bribed you into coming and said that they're not gonna treat you to brunch unless you come with them. <laughs> I know some of your relatives, all right? So I know. We'll, we'll do anything short of sin to get you to church, all right? But as, as we think about this moment, my prayer has been that you would have an encounter with a living God today to experience the resurrected life that he's inviting you into today. Because the resurrected life is the best kind of life to live. And I could you know, keep us here probably until dinner time telling you all of these things that the resurrected life brings us. But because of time, I'm just going to give you Pastor Jim's top four. I call these the four shuns of the resurrected life. Things that when you encounter God and you experience the resurrection on the inside of you, something happens to where you are supernaturally changed into a different person. So I call these the four shuns. If you're taking notes, write down the first shun. And that is simply restoration. Restoration. So the resurrected life brings us restoration because you know the Bible does talk about before the resurrection, there, there was this veil between us and the holy of God. And it says after Jesus resurrected, right? After, after the death on the cross, the veil was torn. And, and, and all of a sudden we had this ability to now come into the holy of holies. Nothing was separating us now. And, and a lot of you, you, you may have never been able to pinpoint exactly what this thing is. But some of you that don't have a relationship with God in this room, there's an emptiness in your life. And you can't quite put your finger on it. And for some time you thought, man, if, if you, I just get married, you know, I, I know that I'll, I'll be happier. I'll feel full of life. You know, if, if I just have some kids, if, if I just get that career going, if I can just make that amount of money, if I can get so many followers on Instagram, I, I, I know these things will, will bring me fullness of life. And, and I know those things don't bring fullness of life. Because the, the people that are thinking, if I can just get married, I know I will be full of life. There's people here that are saying, if I could just be single again, I would be full of life. No elbowing allowed. But, but you know what I mean? There, there's just like, there's something you can't put your finger on, but that just something seems off. That something just feels dead on the inside. I've been loving our hills around our, our valley, haven't you? Have you seen the flowers? You know, you know what I heard somebody tell me last week? That we are going to experience a super bloom this year. How many have heard that? 
So there's a super bloom upon us. And, and one of the reasons that we're gonna experience a super bloom is because now we've had all this rain, right? We've had this abundance of rain and, and we haven't had rain like this. And I'm so super grateful we didn't have rain during COVID because we were meeting outside. But now that the rain is coming, like, like the, the ground is waking up and the ground is naturally ready to produce something beautiful. And I want to tell you something about your life. Your life has been created by God and it's ready to produce something beautiful. But in order for you to experience a super bloom of your life, you must experience the resurrection for your life. That ingredient, the water of life that Jesus said he brings, is the missing link between you and restoration with your God. And once you have that restored relationship with God, just like Lee Strobel's wife experienced that peace and that love and that joy, I mean, it's supernatural. Honestly, I don't know how people make it through this life without this restoration with God. I have sat with people. Unfortunately, as a pastor, I get put into some really gnarly, gritty situations, you know, coming into the room when a family is in crisis and one of the crises that I'll never forget in my life was the crisis with the mass shooting in Vegas. Some of you know my story that I was pastoring a church in Vegas during the mass shooting of October 1st, 2017. And, and I walked into a hotel room and I had to comfort a mom and dad who 10 minutes before I got there got the news that their little girl, 20 year old daughter, didn't make it out alive from the shooting. And here I am in this hotel room. I don't know what to say. What do you say to somebody? that just had their daughter taken from them in such a a, a tragedy. And to make matters even worse, I found out that Chrissy, her mom, was standing right next to her when she received the bullets. And I'm sitting there looking at this mom that's in shock, that is broken, and I just put my arms around Scott and Chrissy, and I just said, Lord, I don't know what to say, God, but I know that in this moment that you can just bring into this this place this, I got music coming at me right now, guys. I don't know. Um, I'm going to groove right now. I don't know. And and so they they had this moment where I'm sitting there and I could just tangibly feel the peace of God fall in that room. It was real. And and everybody felt, and I just told them, I said, can you guys feel this right now? And they were all crying. They said, yes, we can feel something supernatural taking place. That is the power of restoration. Number two, the second shun is the transformation. The transformation. You know, in Romans chapter six, verse four, it says, as Christ was brought back from death to life by the glorious power of the Father, so we too should live a new kind of life. You know, we, we want to live the life that Jesus died and resurrected to give us. And I know this isn't a newsflash for many of you in this room, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we deal with as people. You know, some of you, you, you have anger issues. Others of you have, have bitterness and resentment issues. And some of you have addiction issues. And, and you're, just, you're struggling and you're just like, you, you don't like it. You don't want it. But it just haunts you and it chases you. And you're just like, I don't know if I could ever break free from this. And the good news about the resurrection is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you So if that power is in you, that power is greater than addiction. That power is greater than anger. That power is greater than resentment. And it will change your life. It changed mine. And it's here to change your life too. I love to say it this way. Jesus loves you the way you are, but he refuses to leave you the way you are. That's transformation, baby. And I'm so grateful it happened for my life. And, you know, God does such a good job transforming people. You're looking at me going, you know, like, oh, he's been a pastor all his life. He doesn't get me. No, I get you. I'm a pastor with the past. Okay? I don't need to go into my past, but you're just looking at the transformation. And it might be hard for you imagining this guy doing drugs and doing some crazy stuff. But that was me, B.C., before Christ. You're just getting to see the transformed guy. All right? So the third, the third shun, the third shun is the anticipation. Heaven is for real, guys. 
And no amount of plastic surgeries, no amount of trips to Gold's Gym or 24-hour fitness is going to keep that date from coming for you. I was just reading this week in Newsweek magazine, one out of every one person dies. (laughs) None of us get out of here alive, a friend of mine told me one time. So here's the idea. When you have the resurrection power in you, you know that your death day is actually your graduation day. Your graduation day. And it's coming for all of us. But going back to that highlight reel, what's your highlight reel going to be about? If you know that you have a date to meet with God one day, won't that impact how you're living today? Because we don't know when that day is going to come. But, but if, if we know that Christ is in us and, and the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us, then we can anticipate that day with joy in our heart. I was sitting by my mom's bedside when she took her last final breath on this earth. Not a lot of people have that privilege. I did. It was me, my dad, my brother, and my sister. And we were all there. And, and I, I, I will never forget that moment. She, she just exhaled and then it just stopped. And, and I could tangibly feel a shift in the room. And I knew that my mama was in the presence of God. I knew it. And we, we just started singing I, that, that Mercy Me song. I can only imagine. You know, you know the song, right? I, you don't need me to sing it. I'm, that's not my gifting. All right. But I, I just like, that's so what? Heaven is real. And that, that anticipation that we grieve for our relatives, but those relatives that we know are right with God, we don't have to grieve as those who have no hope because we have the living hope that is a hope that never dies. Check this out, 1 Peter 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy has given us new birth into a what church? A living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Living with heaven in view is the best way to live because it's coming for all of us. Which leads me to the fourth shun, and that is determination. And the best way I can tell you this point is just to read the rest of the chapter here because it, it, it just speaks for itself. I don't really need to preach it. It's already preached right here in our Bibles. Starting at verse 51, it says, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say it one more time. He gives us the what, church? The victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. There's so many reasons in this world to feel like giving up. And even though I'm a pastor, I've been there so many times I can't, I can't count how many times. I've lost count. You ever feel like giving up? Like I don't know if I can make it through another day. Guess what? Because of the resurrected life living in you, you can make it through the difficulty. You can make it through the trouble. You can make it through the mess. Why? Because it's not just you walking through the valley. You have the resurrected Christ walking through the valley of the shadow of death with you. Therefore, you will not fear anything that comes your way. Why? Because he is with you and he's in you. You can keep going. Because when life gets messy, when life gets hard, when life gets troubling, that's when he starts carrying us. That's why you can be determined. Some of you, I believe wholeheartedly that the Holy Spirit, somebody up there, the Holy Spirit brought you supernaturally. 
because you've been feeling like giving up lately. And I want to tell you about the hope of heaven and the resurrected life that he has to give you today. That you don't have the power to keep going, but certainly God has the power to keep you going because there is victory on the other side of your trouble. There, there is resurrection on the other side of that death. You just got to keep going. Look at your neighbor and say, we got to keep going. We got to keep going. And I end with this scripture. This just rocked me. This is a paraphrased translation. This isn't, you know, don't get all weirded out. I mean, going, that's not the Bible. I know it's not the Bible, but I love how Eugene Peterson reads it in the message. He says, the resurrection life you receive from God is not a timid, grave-tending life. It's adventurously expectant. Greeting God with the child like, what's next, Papa? Don't you love that? What Can you imagine waking up tomorrow morning and just saying, what do you have in store for me today, Papa? What, what adventure lies in wait for me today, Papa? Because I know it's going to be a good day because I have a good God that is walking with me, that is living in me. And the same resurrection power that made the tomb empty is now living in me. The Resurrected Life Church is available. And there's an invitation right now for you to accept it. He's calling you into something that you can never have on your own. The question is, are you going to receive the invitation? You may know that Jesus' death and resurrection broke the power of sin and death. But do you know, there's, there's an invitation right now for a resurrected life to begin today in you. Some of you that have never said yes to following Jesus, I want to pray with you. Some of you that maybe have been wandering, and I call it drifting. There's a, there's a worldly drift that happens naturally to all of us. And if we're not careful, those who used to go to church all the time, those who used to read their Bible, and those who used to pray, you, you can just get into this drift, of this current, and just you're drifting away. But today, maybe it's the first day that you've been back to church in five years, in ten years and we don't care who you are, what you've done, or where you've been. We're just glad that you're here today. We're just glad that you're here today. And God wants to give you the resurrected life back. He wants to give that to you too. So while everyone is just sitting in their chairs, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but just close your eyes. And this is a holy moment that I want to invite you into just to meet with God. He's for real. Heaven is for real. And my friends, the resurrection is real. And in this moment, Jesus, we thank you for the empty tomb. In this moment, we're so grateful that the sin and death that rules this world has been broken so that now your life could reign in us. That life that brings us restoration. That life that brings us transformation. That life that brings us anticipation and determination. God, we're grateful for it all, but... Lord, my prayer is for those that may have never said yes to making a decision to follow you, Jesus, to receiving your Holy Spirit to live in them. Lord, may your resurrected life meet them in their mess right now in this moment. And if you're ready to invite Jesus to live inside of you, that's what the cross is all about. He died so that your sins could be forgiven and that you could be restored to God. And in this moment, the invitation is there. Are you ready to receive the invitation? And if you would like to, just pray this prayer after me right where you're sitting. Just pray this. Say, Jesus, today I invite you to change my life, to have your way with me, to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for dying for my sins and breaking the power of sin and death from my life. And for giving me the opportunity to live with resurrected life, with the hope of heaven. For today, I make a decision to follow you, Jesus, with my life. For today, I'm making a decision to re-follow you, Jesus, with my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Go ahead and look up at me again, you guys. If you made that decision, and I don't know if you did, I can't see you, there's lights on me. But if you prayed that prayer, 
I want you to do two things for me today, all right? Number one, tell somebody. Maybe somebody that brought you said, you know what? When that pastor said that, I, I prayed that at the end. But number two, let us know. And the easiest way for you to let us know is you use that phone that I'm sure you have with you is to text the word follow to 805-334-8700 and, and you text that word and, and that way we can connect with you. And if you need any resources to help you in your faith, we, we would love uh, to connect with you that way. Today, we have a table outside. Normally we have prayer afterwards, but the prayer table's outside. We would love to pray for you. We have like 200 Bibles. We would love to give these Bibles a home in your, in your home. All right, so stop by the booth, check in with us, text that word follow, and are, are you guys ready to worship some more? Because I believe today we need to do a little bit more worship to be so grateful for the resurrected life that he has given you. Can you just knuckle bump your neighbor and say, I'm grateful for the resurrected life. Let's stand to our feet, church. Let's worship our living God. Thank you for tuning in today to another great message from Atmosphere Church. If this message is spoken to your heart, would you take a moment and share it with your friends? You can connect with us on Spotify, iTunes, podcast, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Simply do a search for Atmosphere Church through these various platforms and then click the follow or subscribe button. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you should see it right below this video. It's another great way for us to be able to stay connected with you. If you live in the Southern California area, we would love to invite you to be part of our family. For more information about our church, go to our official webpage at atmosphere.church. Finally, if this service and our other resources bless you, would you consider giving back to Atmosphere Church to support not only these things, but also support the creation of even more resources for you? To make a donation, simply go to our website and click on the tab that says Give. Your gift of any amount is greatly appreciated. Until next time, we pray that you will keep the faith, spread the hope, and live the love.